20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Part 2. Chapter 3. The Pearl of Ten Millions. The next morning at four o'clock I was awakened by the steward whom Captain Natmo had placed at my service. I rose hurriedly, dressed, and went into the saloon. Captain Natmo was awaiting me. M. Heratnax, said he, are you ready to start? I am ready. Then please to follow me. And my companions, Captain. They have been told and are waiting. Are we not to put on our divers' dresses? Asked I. Not yet. I have not allowed the Nautilus to come to near this coast, and we are some distance from the Manara bank, but the boat is ready, and will take us to the exact point of disembarking, which will save us a long way. It carries our diving apparatus which we will put on when we begin our submarine journey. Captain Nemo conducted me to the central staircase, which led on the platform. Nem and Concile were already there, delighted at the idea of the pleasure party which was preparing. Five sailors from the Nautilus, with their oars, waited in the boat which had been made fast against the side. The night was still dark. Layers of clouds covered the sky, allowing but few stars to be seen. I looked on the side where the land lay, and saw nothing but a dark line enclosing three parts of the horizon, from southwest to northwest. The Nautilus having returned during the night of the western coast of Ceylon, was now west of the bay, or rather gulf, formed by the mainland and the island of Manar. There, under the dark waters, stretched the Pindadine bank, an inexhaustible field of pearls, the length of which is more than twenty miles. Captain Natmo, Neckland, Concile, and I took our places in the stern of the boat. The master went to the tiller, his fur companions leaned on their oars, the painter was cast off, and we sheared off. The boat went towards the south, the oarsmen did not hurry. I noticed that their strokes, strong in the water, only followed each other every ten seconds, according to the method generally adopted in the Navy. Whilst the craft was running by its own velocity, the liquid drops struck the dark depths of the waves crisply like spats of melted lead. A little below, spreading wide, gave a slight roll to the boat and some samphire reeds flapped before it. We were silent. What was Captain Natmo thinking of? Perhaps of the land he was approaching, and which he found too near to him, contrary to the Canadian's opinion, who thought it too far off. As to Concile, he was merely there from curiosity. About half past five, the first tints on the horizon showed the upper line of coast more distinctly. Flat enough in the east, it rose a little to the south. Five miles still lay between us, and it was indistinct owing to the mist on the water. That six o'clock, it became suddenly daylight with that rapidity peculiar to tropical regions, which know neither dawn nor twilight. The solar rays pierced the curtain of clouds, piled up on the eastern horizon, 
and the radiant orb rose rapidly. I saw land distinctly, with a few trees scattered here and there. The boat neared mine our island, which was rounded to the south. Captain Nemo rose from his seat and watched the sea. At a sign from him the anchor was dropped, but the chain scarcely ran, for it was little more than a yard deep, and this spot was one of the highest points of the bank of Pintadines. Here we are, M. Aratnax, said Captain Nemo. You see that enclosed bay. Here, in a month, will be assembled the numerous fishing boats of the exporters, and these are the waters their divers will transact so boldly. Happily, this bay is well situated for that kind of fishing. It is sheltered from the strongest winds. The sea is never very rough here which makes it favorable for the diver's work. We will now put on our dresses, and begin our walk. I did not answer, and, while watching the suspected waves, began with the help of the sailors to put on my heavy sea dress. Captain Natmo and my companions were also dressing. None of the Nautilus men were to accompany us on this new excursion. Soon we were enveloped to the throat in India rubber clothing, the air apparatus fixed to our backs by braces. As to the rum caught apparatus, there was no necessity for it. Before putting my head into the copper cap, I had asked the question of the captain. They would be useless, he replied. We are going to no great depth, and the solar rays will be enough to light our walk. Besides, it would not be prudent to carry any electric light in these waters. Its brilliancy might attract some of the dangerous inhabitants of the coast most inopportunely. As Captain Natmo pronounced these words, I turned to Consile and Natland. But my two friends had already encased their heads in the metal cap, and they could neither hear nor answer. One last question remained to ask of Captain Natmo. And our arms? Ask I. Our guns? Guns? What for? Do not mountaineers attack the bear with a dagger in their hand, and is not steel surer than lead? Here is a strong blade. Put it in your belt, and we start. I looked at my companions. They were armed like us. And, more than that, Ned Land was brandishing an enormous harpoon, which he had placed in the boat before leaving the Nautilus. Then, following the captain's example, I allowed myself to be dressed in the heavy copper helmet and our reservoirs of air were at once in activity. An instant after we were landed, one after the other, in about two yards of water upon an even sand. Captain Nemo made the sign with his hand, and we followed him by the gentle declivity till we disappeared under the waves. Never did the ships of a squadron maneuver with more unity. At that moment night fell suddenly, and the reeds, scarcely raised by the breeze, lay peaceably under the sides of the Nautilus. The next day, 26th of January, we cut the equator at the 82nd meridian and entered the northern hemisphere. During the day a formidable troop of sharks accompanied us, 
terrible creatures, which multiply in these seas and make them very dangerous. They were cestratiotally pie sharks, with brown backs and whitish bellies, armed with eleven rows of teeth eyed sharks their throat being marked with a large black spot surrounded with white light and eye. There were also some Isabella sharks, with rounded snouts marked with dark spots. These powerful creatures often hurled themselves at the windows of the saloon with such violence as to make us feel very insecure. At such times Ned Land was no longer master of himself. He wanted to go to the surface and harpoon a monsters, particularly certain smooth hound sharks, whose mouth is studded with teeth like a mosaic, and large tiger sharks nearly six yards long, the last name of which seemed to excite him more particularly. But the Nautilus, accelerating her speed, easily left the most rapid of them behind. The 27th of January, at the entrance of the vast Bay of Bengal, we met repeatedly a forbidding spectacle, dead bodies floating on the surface of the water. They were the dead of the Indian villages, carried by the gangs to the level of the sea, and which the vultures the only undertakers of the country, had not been able to devour. But the sharks did not fail to help them at their funeral work. At about seven o'clock we found ourselves at last surveying the oyster banks on which the pearl oysters are reproduced by millions. Captain Nemo pointed with his hand to the enormous heap of oysters and I could well understand that this mine was inexhaustible, for nature's creative power is far beyond man's instinct of destruction. Neckland, faithful to his instinct, hastened to fill a net which he carried by his side with some of the finest specimens. But we could not stop. We must follow the captain who seemed to guide himself by paths known only to himself. The ground was sensibly rising, and sometimes, on holding up my arm, it was above the surface of the sea. Then the level of the bank would sink capriciously. Often we rounded high rocks scarfed into pyramids. In their dark fractures huge crustacea, perched upon their high claws like some war machine, watched us with fixed eyes, and under our feet crawled various kinds of annelids. At this moment there opened before us a large grotto dug in a picturesque heap of rocks and carpeted with all the thick warp of the submarine flora. At first it seemed very dark to me. The solar rays seemed to be extinguished by successive gradations, until its vague transparency became nothing more than drowned light. Captain Nemo entered. We followed. My eyes soon accustomed themselves to this relative state of darkness. I could distinguish the arches springing capriciously from natural pillars, standing broad upon their granite base, like the heavy columns of Tuscan architecture. Why had our incomprehensible guide led us to the bottom of this submarine crypt? I was soon to know. After descending a rather sharp declivity, our feet trod the bottom of a kind of circular pit. Their captain Natmo stopped, and with his hand indicated an object I had not yet perceived. 
It was an oyster of extraordinary dimensions, the gigantic Tridacne, the goblet which could have contained the whole lake of holy water. A basin the breadth of which was more than two yards and a half, and consequently larger than that ornamenting the saloon of the Nautilus. I approached this extraordinary mollusk. It adhered by its filaments to a table of granite, and there isolated. It developed itself in the calm waters of the grotto. I estimated the weight of this tridacne at 600 pounds. Such an oyster would contain 30 pounds of meat, and one must have the stomach of a gargantua to demolish some dozens of them. Captain Natmo was evidently acquainted with the existence of this bivalve and seemed to have a particular motive in verifying the actual state of this tridacne. The shells were a little open. The captain came near and put his dagger between to prevent them from closing. Then with his hand he raised the membrane with its fringe edges, which formed a cloak for the creature. There. Between the folded plates, I saw a loose pearl, whose size equaled that of a cocoa nut. Its globular shape, perfect clearness, and admirable luster made it altogether a jewel of inestimable value. Carried away by my curiosity, I stretched out my hand to see fit, weigh it, and touch it. But the captain stopped me, made a sign of refusal, and quickly withdrew his dagger, and the two shells closed suddenly. I then understood Captain Natmo's intention. In leaving this pearl hidden in the mantle of the Triadacne he was allowing it to grow slowly. Each year the secretions of the mollusk would add new concentric circles. I estimated its value at L500000 at least. After ten minutes Captain Natmo stopped suddenly. I thought he had halted previously to returning. No, by a gesture he bade us crouch beside him in a deep fracture of the rock. His hand pointed to one part of the liquid mass, which I watched attentively. About five yards from me the shadow appeared, and sank to the ground. The disquieting idea of sharks shot through my mind, but I was mistaken. And once again it was not a monster of the ocean that we had anything to do with. It was a man, a living man, an Indian, a fisherman, the poor devil who, I suppose, had come to glean before the harvest. I could see the bottom of his canoe anchored some feet above his head. He dived and went up successively. The stones held between his feet, cut in the shape of a sugar loaf, whilst the rope fastened him to his boat, helped him to descend more rapidly. This was all his apparatus. Reaching the bottom, about five yards deep, he went on his knees and filled his bag with oysters picked up at random. Then he went up, emptied it, pulled up his stone, and began the operation once more, which lasted thirty seconds. The diver did not see us. The shadow of the rock hid us from sight. And how should this poor Indian ever dream that men, beings like himself, should be there under the water watching his movements and losing no detail of the fishing? Several times he went up in this way, and dived again. 
he did not carry away more than ten at each plunge, for he was obliged to pull them from the bank to which they adhered by means of their strong bisous. And how many of those oysters for which he risked his life had no pearl in them? I watched him closely. His maneuvers were regular, and for the space of half an hour no danger appeared to threaten him. I was beginning to accustom myself to the sight of this interesting fishing, when suddenly, as the Indian was on the ground, I saw him make a gesture of terror, rise, and make a spring to return to the surface of the sea. I understood his dread. The gigantic shadow appeared just above the unfortunate diver. It was a shark of enormous size advancing diagonally, his eyes on fire, and his jaws open. I was mute with horror and unable to move. The voracious creature shot towards the Indian, who threw himself on one side to avoid the shark's fins, but not its tail, for it struck his chest and stretched him on the ground. This scene lasted but a few seconds. The shark returned, and, turning on his back, prepared himself for cutting the Indian into. When I saw Captain Natmo rise suddenly, and then, dagger in hand, walk straight to a monster, ready to fight face to face with him. The very moment the shark was going to snap the unhappy fisherman into, he perceived his new adversary, and, turning over, made straight towards him. I can't still see Captain Natmo's position. Holding himself well together, he waited for the shark with admirable coolness, and, when it rushed at him, threw himself on one side with wonderful quickness, avoiding the shock, and burying his dagger deep into its side. But it was not all over. The terrible combat ensued. The shark had seemed to roar, if I might say so. The blood rushed in torrents from its wound. The sea was dyed red, and through the opaque liquid I could distinguish nothing more. Nothing more until the moment when, like lightning, I saw the undaunted captain hanging on to one of the creature's pins, struggling, as it were, hand to hand with a monster, and dealing successive blows at his enemy, yet still unable to give the decisive one. The sharks struggled agitated the water with such fury that the rocking threatened to upset me. I wanted to go to the captain's assistance, but, nailed to the spot with horror, I could not stir. I saw the haggard die, I saw the different phases of the fight. The captain fell to the earth, upset by the enormous mass which leant upon him. The shark's jaws opened wide like a pair of factory shears, and it would have been all over with the captain, but, quick as thought, harpoon in hand, Netland rushed towards the shark and struck it with its sharp point. The waves were impregnated with a mass of blood. They rocked under the shark's movements, which beat them with indescribable fury. Ned Land had not missed his aim. It was a monster's death rattle. Struck to the heart, it struggled in dreadful convulsions, the shock of which overthrew Consil. But Ned Land had disentangled the captain, who, 
getting up without any wound, went straight to the Indian, quickly cut the cord which held him to his stone, took him in his arms, and, with a sharp blow of his heel, mounted to the surface. We all three followed in a few seconds, saved by a miracle, and reached the fisherman's boat. Captain Nemo's first care was to recall the unfortunate man to life again. I did not think he could succeed. I hoped so, for the poor creature's immersion was not long but the blow from the shark's tail might have been his death blow. Happily, with the captain's and Conciles' sharp friction, I saw consciousness return by degrees. He opened his eyes. What was his surprise, his terror even, that thing for great copper heads leaning over him? And, above all, what must he have thought when Captain Natmo, drawing from the pocket of his dress a bag of pearls, placed it in his hand? This munificent charity from the man of the waters to the poor Seagulls was accepted with a trembling hand. His wondering eyes showed that he knew not to what superhuman beings he owed both fortune and life. At a sign from the captain Weary gained the bank, and, following the road already traversed, came in about half an hour to the anchor which held the canoe of the Nautilus to the earth. Once on board, we each, with the help of the sailors, got rid of the heavy copper helmet. Captain Nemo's first word was to the Canadian Thank you, Masterland, said he. It was in revenge, Captain, replied Nagland. I owed you that. The ghastly smile passed across the captain's lips, and that was all. To the Nautilus, said he. The boat flew over the waves. Some minutes after we met the shark's dead body floating by the black marking of the extremity of its fins, I recognized the terrible melanopteron of the Indian seas, of the species of shark so properly called. It was more than twenty-five feet long, its enormous mouth occupied one-third of its body. It was an adult, as was known by its six rows of teeth placed in an isosceles triangle in the upper jaw. Whilst I was contemplating this inert mass, a dozen of these voracious beasts appeared round the boat, and, without noticing us, threw themselves upon the dead body and fought with one another for the pieces. At half past eight we were again on board the Nautilus. There I reflected on the incidents which had taken place in our excursion to the Manara Bank. To conclusions I must inevitably draw from it one bearing upon the unparalleled courage of Captain Natmo, the other upon his devotion to a human being a representative of that race from which he fled beneath the sea. Whatever he might say, this strange man had not yet succeeded in entirely crushing his heart. When I made this observation to him, he answered in a slightly moved tone. That Indian, sir, is an inhabitant of an oppressed country, and I am still and shall be, to my last breath, one of them.